Let's uh, get our Bibles and do our Bible confession like we do every Sunday. Don't we want you guys giving a bad report to the pastors when they come back? I forgot this. This is my Bible. This is God speaking to me. My eyes are open. My heart is prepared to receive all of God's promises and instructions. Today I make my Bible the final authority in my life so that in every circumstance I will bear good fruit and others will see Christ in me. In Jesus' name, amen. Got little notes and little cards everywhere. The title for my message today or for my teaching today is uh, Keepers of the Flame. Back in ancient times, back in Grecian ancient times, the Olympic Games back in ancient Greece, athletes from all over the country would be handed a torch with a special flame taken from the altar of Hestia in Olympia. And with that torch in hand, each runner would, would run their leg of the race as hard and as far as they could before connecting their lit torch to the unlit torches of those who would come after them. Where those flames would eventually light up what we call the Olympic flame. To them back in Grecian time, the symbolism was sacred, representing the light of life and knowledge. And that gets passed down from one generation to another generation. You see, in ancient Greece, these Olympic runners were the keepers of the flame. The pastors of the torch. There's a sense in which, from the very beginning, God has handed his dreams of community to a human being and then asked the leader of that covenantal community, Abraham, to hand that torch on to somebody else. And that's why it was important in those times that Abraham and Sarah have a child, that they would have someone to pass that torch of leadership on to somebody else. It went from Abraham to Isaac, Isaac to Jacob, and Jacob to Joseph. And yet this happens not just between parents and children. For Moses, for example, will pass the torch on to Joshua, and Eli will pass the torch on to Samuel. Jesus would one day pass the torch, the same torch on, to the 12 disciples, while Paul would pass his torch on to Timothy. In fact, Paul writes in 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy, and that's a key word right there, trustworthy people who will be, who will be able to pass them on to others. It's what Jesus said in the Great Commission in Matthew. I have been given all authority in heaven and earth, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of age. He has promised that he's been, he'll, he will be with us. Well, what I'd like to talk about this morning is to take a look at our bulletin. I got, or I better state it, the Holy Spirit gave me the inspiration for this teaching a couple of months ago. After giving the morning announcements, I sat back where I usually sit, and I looked at the bulletin, and I was reading the bulletin, and more specifically, I was reading our vision statement. One body, united by love and discipleship. And that's our vision statement for the river. Now, I have no difficulty at all seeing the love in this church body. Any church our size that has survived the obstacles and the trials that we have and we still keep going, We're like the ever ready uh, rabbit, we just keep going, has to be led by and worked by people who not only exhibit love, but also live out that love with one another. So the love is evident, but the Holy Spirit kept bringing back up to me was the second part, discipleship. Over the next few days and weeks, I looked at God's heart, and I searched his heart, and I searched his scriptures concerning discipleship and mentorship, looking at God's heart for giving away what's been given to each one of us. Each one of us has been given a torch. 
Whether we choose to pass it on is our choice, but God wants us to pass that torch on. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a a moment in time when one amazing prophet that uh, Pastor Ron has already spoken of, Elijah, was told by God to pass that torch to a green to a green thumb farmer named Elisha. Well, I'm going to have problems here because to say Elijah and Elisha, but I'm going to do my best I can to, to keep those two names straight. It's incredible to me because there is a sense in which God's dream, his manifest destiny, God's work is at risk every generation. Just as it was in Olympia, the question is where will there be someone to keep the torch lit? Will somebody pass that torch on? Because it doesn't happen automatically. Everybody in this room this morning is here. You are here because you, to some degree, had someone hand you, hand the torch to you. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was a teacher. Maybe it was somebody in ministry. Maybe it was a friend. Whoever it was, somebody nurtured your faith. Somebody saw gifts and potential in you. Somebody took the time and prayed for you. Somebody gave you responsibility. Somebody cheered you on. You have to understand this. In every generation, from Abraham to ours, in every generation, somebody passed the torch to somebody else. Not a single generation was skipped. That's why we're all able to be here today. So as we look into the life of Elijah this morning, I'd like for you to ask the question to yourself right now. Do I have people in my life that I'm passing the torch to? Who am I invested in? What I've been given by God. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. You're probably already there. Thank you, Pastor Ron. And as you do that, let me give you a little of the back history. It's kind of John, Pastor Ron already kind of shared what goes on there. Before Elisha enters our story here, you may remember how Elijah not only defied Ahab, and, and Pastor Ron shared how he was one of the most despicable and kings that the northern kingdom already had. Because remember at this time, the kingdoms were divided. There was Judah and there was Israel. And Israel, the northern kingdom, the kings that were in that northern kingdom were some of the worst kings that had ever been. They were, they were, they were against God. And there were just so many things that, that made God unhappy. And as, God said, as Ron shared with us, God told Elijah to warn them of the three years of drought that were to come. And where we're coming in is toward the end of where, where Pastor Ron, where he went and he, he challenged them. He challenged the prophets of Baal and of Esherah. He challenged them to a contest, basically. He said, could you bring rain or can my God bring rain? Let us see who the real God is. And he challenged them. And they, they brought 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. And he told them, start fire, start fire, start fire, bring rain. And they, for, this went on for some time. And, he, and Elijah was a little bit of a trash talker. When it was his turn, he said, he brought the, the, the wood up there and they started to get ready to start the fire. He said, well, pour water on there. And he said, pour water on there again. Pour water on there again. And as they were talking to their gods, they said, maybe you, maybe you need to talk a little louder. Maybe they can't hear you. Teasing them and saying, you know, it's not going to happen. I know it's not going to happen, but te- maybe they can't hear you. Talk a little louder. Maybe your gods just don't hear you. Maybe they're asleep. Maybe they're somewhere else. And he did some trash talking. And by the end of the day, like Pastor Ron shared with us, Elijah prayed. He prayed God brought down fire. He ignited that wood with a strike of lightning and he absorbed all the water that had been poured on the wood. And then, like Pastor Ron shared, he began to pray. And he prayed seven times and he sent his servant to go look for the cloud. And finally, like he said, the servant came back. There is a cloud in the horizon about the size of a man's hand is coming. And, he, and, and Elijah knew, my God is answering my prayer. A small cloud, and that's all he needed. And he did some more trash talking. He told Ahab, run, run before the rains get you. And you won't get back to your, to your city of Jezreel. Run, run as fast as you can. And the word, God's word tells us that, he was, that Elijah was given superhuman strength. Now, I don't know how, how many of you know much about horses. I know a little bit, but I know the horses run pretty fast. 
he was given superhuman strength to the point to where he was running beside the horse and telling Ahab, run, run, run as fast as you can. Get back before the waters get you. And he got back and he told Jezreel, Jezebel, who was the queen, about what had happened. And Jezebel wasn't happy at all. Like, it was the ultimate showdown, like I said, where the power of God, of God puts to utter shame the so-called power of Baal. But when Ahab's wife, Jezebel, hears what Elijah did to all their prophets, one thing I meant, mentioned, and Ron did mention it, he killed all the prophets. He killed 850 of the prophets of Baal and of Esherah. And Ahab's coming back giving the report to Jezebel. Sent, and Jezebel sends a messenger to Elijah saying, and this is in verses 2 and 3 of chapter, chapter 19, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like one of them. Basically she was telling him, I'm, I'm going to kill you. I'm coming after you. I'm going to kill you. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. Doesn't say, the Bible doesn't say a lot about Jezebel, but I can tell you right now, it must have been one bad girl. <laughs> because here's a guy that just killed 850 prophets, prayed for God to strike the fire and light it, prayed for rain, and rain came, and now Jezebel tells you, I'm going to kill you, and this guy runs. He runs so far, he runs almost 400 miles down to Mount Sinai. And so in despair, he pours out his heart before God. And what does he pray? He asks for God to take his life. And it's a beautiful story if you, see, if you look at it. It's, it's, and I think all these stories are in the Bible to give us encouragement because we feel that way sometimes too. We could have a mountain high today or tomorrow, and on Tuesday, we're back in the valley again. And it shows how God can lift us up. I encourage you to read the story of how God brought him back. He whispered in his ears, what, what are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you hiding here? And this is where our story begins for us, at least. Elijah, who had just prayed and saw fire come down from heaven, who prayed for rain and saw a drought ended, prays for one more thing. But this time he prays, God, let me die. You see, part of the good news is that sometimes God loves you so much that he doesn't answer your prayer. And in this instance, he didn't answer Elijah's prayer. He didn't, he didn't let Elijah die. Instead, he gave him encouragement, and he gave him his next job. Instead, in verse 15, the Lord said to him, Go back the way you came, and go to the desert of Damascus. And when you get there, anoint Haz Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint, anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elijah, son of Shaphat, from Abel Mehalah, to succeed you as prophet. And this is where our story begins. So God tell, calls Elijah to go and anoint some kings. But not just that. He then says to Elijah, I want you to anoint your successor. I want you to begin to pass the torch. And so in 1919, we're told, Elijah went from there and found Elijah, son of Shaphat. And he was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen, and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Elijah went up to him, threw his cloak around him. Elijah then left his oxen and ran after Elijah. Let me kiss my father and my mother goodbye, and he, he said, and then I will come with you. Go back, replied Elijah, but think about what I have done to you in placing this cloak around Elisha. So Elijah left and went back. He took his yoke of oxen and slaughtered them. He burned the plowing equipment, cooked the meat, and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he set out to follow Elijah and become his attendant, to become his disciple. And so here's what's going on. Elijah goes to the field where Elijah is plowing. And as he approaches Elijah, he takes off his cloak and drapes it over his, his shoulders, Elijah's shoulders, while he's out working. Now in the old, in the King James Version, it refers to his cloak as his mantle. And he puts his mantle on him. Elijah takes it off his mantle and he puts it on Elijah. And there's some significance to that, which is a very visible way for Elijah to say to Elisha, I want you to walk together 
with me. I want you to watch what I do and to do it you're together. I want you to teach you and invest in you and give you responsibility. I want your flame to burn a little brighter. And then one day, you'll do the same on your own. I want to pass the torch on to you. I mean, this was a huge moment for Elijah. Everybody knew who Elijah was. He was the prophet of Israel. He's probably the what, like Pastor Ron, probably the most well-known prophets of that time, and even now, uh, everyone knew who he was. It was an extraordinary honor for Elijah. In these times, it was well known that what the significance of the mantle was. Not everybody wore a mantle, and specifically this type of mantle. And Elijah passed over to Elijah and threw his mantle on him. And let's notice two things here. One, this mantle was the official garment of a prophet. There were three types of mantles worn in biblical times. This is the adoreth, or depending on what dictionary you look at, the adoreth, a cloak that could be made of animal hair. It was woven animal hair and was a garment of distinction worn by kings and especially by prophets. The mantle automatically marked a man as a prophet, a spokesman of God. It was also a symbol of sacrifice and commitment. The life of a prophet was not the life of luxury, The mantle represented a man's gift, the call of God, and the purpose for which God had called him. Throwing over the shoulders of Elijah was a symbolic act denoting his summons to the office of prophet, but it was also a sure sign of God's gift that enabled him to fulfill the prophetic office of ministry. This act by Elijah was a prophetic announcement that the gift of prophecy had been given or would come to Elisha. It was immediately understood by Elijah, even without words. Elijah was a Jew, and he was taught by his parents, obviously, Jewish traditions, and he knew Jewish law, and he knew all these things. And he knew that when someone comes and places your mantle on you, he knew what it meant, especially because, like I said, everybody knew who Elijah was. So when when this happened to him, and the immediate response he had was to get up and say, let me go say kiss my mother and father goodbye. His response was immediate. He knew what he was getting into. And we're going to get into that in, in a little bit more when we get to, uh, as we go on. But understand that this was no simple request. One thing we need to notice about Elijah, in that day a typical family might own a few chickens, and if you were pretty well off, you'd own one ox. If you remember the scripture, what the scripture said, to have 12 yoke of oxen, that was 24 ox that he had because each, each yoke was connected to or tied to one yoke, uh, <laughs> two oxen. And they had 24. It was almost unheard of in those times for any family to, to own that. It'd be like a farmer owning 50 tractors right now. It's, it's, it's a well-to-do farm. It's a well-to-do family. Clearly, Elijah's family were people of wealth. They have a mansion in Lake Las Vegas, a big summer place in Montana or Colorado, they're wealthy people. So what Elijah is asking here, it involves an enormous sacrifice. Here's Elisha in the field plowing, and he's got 24 yoke of oxen in there. And he's, he's wealthy. He's got a future in front of him. I'm sure he knows this already. He says, when my father passes away, I'm going to get all of this. I, why would I want to leave? But yet when Elijah puts his mantle on his shoulder, he almost immediately, the word tells us, he left his yoke of oxen, and he says, let me go tell my parents goodbye. And he knew what he was doing. Truth is, the Bible almost says nothing about Elijah's background other than him being chosen as a prophet. Most likely, he was from a poor family. We're talking about Elijah, Elijah now. So accepting his calling may not have seemed, at least up front, to, meet, to be much of a difficult choice. It might have been an improvement in his life. He didn't have a lot of job job alternatives, but Elisha is another story. He had it made. Clearly, Elisha will inherit a way of life from his father that will keep him comfortable throughout his life if he chooses to stay at home, if he chooses that, that, that life for him. And yet Elijah is supposed to ask him to give it all up for a job that will likely involve the rejection and opposition of stubborn kings and people who will want him dead. And that's why he tells him, go back and realize what I'm asking you to do. 
You see, it would have been very easy for Elijah to say, God, you must have the wrong, you must have made a mistake. <laughs> Elijah's not going to walk away from a future like he has to follow a prophet like me. He's got too many attractive options. You've got the, you've got the wrong guy. I'm not even going to ask. But Elijah does ask. And he passes the torch on. And Israel and the world are changed. You see, in terms of passing the torch, in terms of living out our kingdom lives, you don't ever say no on behalf of somebody else. You never decide for somebody else whether or not they want to do something or not. Or at least we shouldn't. We always do. Never assume that somebody doesn't want to get involved. Don't ever assume they don't want to learn or grow or belong or to serve. There is a study I read about volunteerism. I, wrote it a few, I read it a few months ago, and it came back to mind when I was doing this. They asked volunteers. When volunteers were asked how they happened to get involved in a particular activity, whatever they were doing, the most common answer is, what do you think the common answer, most common answer was? Somebody asked me. Somebody asked me to come here today and help with this fundraising or this whatever the event was. Somebody asked me, and I was glad to come. They asked the opposite question, or conversely, when people were asked, why didn't they volunteer or donate? Guess what the number one answer was? Nobody asked. And hasn't that happened to you? When you hear about some fundraising event or one of your co-workers is trying to raise money for their, their sports team or something, well, if I would have known, I would have bought some cookies or I would have bought this or I would have given you money. But they weren't asked. It's, but Elijah went ahead and asked. Even though what he saw around him, he said, doesn't make sense, Lord. It's not making sense. This guy's got a future ahead of him. You want me to ask him? You want me to put my mantle on his shoulders and, and for him to follow me? What future have I got for him other than the kings and queens that are, are going to want to kill him? I just ran for Jezebel. And you want me to ask him to follow me and to learn from me and do these things? And yet he did. At its core, volunteer means something much deeper than just being volunteers. It means somebody who freely embraces the task, even though they don't have to, even though they have other options. They choose to devote themselves willingly, voluntarily, it flows out of the nature of God who voluntarily gives himself to his people. Christ volunteered to come down from his throne and live here on earth. And as the Bible, as the word says, tabernacle with us, which means he came here to live with us and among, with, among us, walk with us, talk with us, and teach us. He chose that. He volunteered to do that for us. And we should all be grateful that he did. And he invites his followers to do the same thing, to give to serve, to step into the game, to serve as Jesus said, and not to be served. But Elijah did more than just go and say goodbye to his parents. In verse 21, Elijah slaughters his team of oxen and throws a huge barbecue for all the people. He, he killed his two oxen that was tied to his yoke, and he throws a big party for everybody to celebrate, I'm leaving. Do you know how much meat is a side of beef? It's a lot of beef. It was a big barbecue. Let's just say he's throwing a huge feast. It shows his heart for people, and it shows his generosity. But it also shows his faith in that Elijah isn't trying to maintain a safety net in case this prophet thing doesn't work out. He's cutting his ties to his past. He's saying, this is what I've chosen to do. This is where I'm going. And I'm not going to leave what I had here behind me so that, well, you know, if it doesn't work out, I can always come back to do this. He's cutting his, his past behind and he's going forward. After that, we read in verse 21, then he set out to follow Elijah and to become his attendant, to become his disciple, to learn from him, to walk with him and talk with him and, find, and see what he is that Elijah does. He gives up a privileged position as a wealthy heir to become a servant, a learner, and a follower. We see Elijah's humility here. He had everything. He'd be like Donald Trump's son. Baron, I think his name is. Baron. Someone walks up to him and says, I'm putting my mantle on you and I want you to follow me. And there's some poor guy that nobody likes. And yet he, yet he still says, yes, I'm going to go. I'm going to give up all this, give this all away. I'm going to give this all up, all that my father has worked for. And I know that I'm going to inherit at least a part of it. And a part of it is a lot, of it, a lot when we're talking about the Trumps. 
and he still gives it up. Not only does that, but he says, I, I, I'm going to burn whatever it is that's mine. Keep it. I don't want it. I'm never going to come back for it. So we see his humility and his heart to serve. Now, we're going to skip ahead here a couple of years, and we're going to go to King, Second Kings. We don't know exactly how many years have gone by, except by this time Elijah and Elisha have been together for quite some time. We're told in verse 1 that when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. So they spent many years with Elisha learning from Elijah all that needs to be done. And one of the biggest tasks they had was, was getting the nation of the northern kingdom away from worshiping other gods, or away from worshiping Baal. That was Elijah's main focus in the northern kingdom, was getting these people. Because like we said before, Ahab had allowed them. Jezreel had brought that to the northern kingdom. When he married her, he started worshiping her gods, and this offended God. And that was, that was Elijah's mission for the northern kingdom, was to get them away from doing this. And so this is what Elijah had been learning, is how to get them away. My guess is that by now, both Elijah and Elisha know that Elijah is, is it going to be around for much longer. His time has come. It's time, for, it's, not, it's time for the torch to be passed on to Elisha and for him to start his ministry. You stay here, Elijah tells him. The Lord has sent me to Bethel. This is Elijah speaking to Elijah and saying, you stay here. This is, way of, this is Elijah's way of saying, you stay here. I'm going to be taken away. You stay here. and It's time for you to start your ministry. But what does Elijah tell him? He says, no, where you go, I go. I will be by your side all the time. So you see the relationship that they have now. It's more, not just a, it's just not a normal relationship of like a supervisor and a, work, a, a worker. This is a father and son. This is a relationship that has been built, built up over years. But Elisha gives a very strong response. He says, nothing, nothing doing. As sure as the Lord lives and as you live, I will not leave you. At this point, nearly everyone around, Elijah must have been in, in, in later in years, understands that his time is coming to an end. Once they're in Bethel, which were where they were going, the same thing happens again. Elijah says, says, Elijah, I need to go to Jericho now, but you stay here. And Elijah, Elijah tells them the same thing, nothing doing, Elijah, I will not leave you. And so they will all, so they all look the way back to the Jordan River. So then why is Elijah taking Elijah on this strange journey? I think Elijah is trying to release Elijah. Like I said, he's trying to tell him, this is time for you to start your ministry. And it's probably tough for him to say goodbye. Like I said, that, that relationship, that bond had been developed between them. So it was hard for him to say goodbye. It was easier for me to say, I got to go over here, you stay here, and let the Lord take me. But they had developed that bond. That bond that could only happen when you take someone under your wing and you become their mentor and they become your disciple. So then why is Elijah taking this journey? I think Elijah is trying to release Elijah. As if they were trying to say, Elijah, you're ready now. I need you to, I need you to go so that you can begin what God has, has for you. And yet I think the reason the writer includes a story here in, in 2 Kings is to show the character of Elijah, to demonstrate Elijah's unshakable loyalty toward Elijah. Like I, like I said before, they developed a bond. They were more than just two people walking a path together. They had developed a bond where they were, were friends. They were father and son. They were mentor and disciple over the years. Through the whole, this whole story, you can see the kind of loyalty that develops between the one who is building in and the one who is being built into. Between the one who has been passing on the torch and the one who is grabbing a hold of it. So we, we see now that the torch is, 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 is being passed. You see, Elijah and Elijah are not just devoted to their task. They're devoted to one another. Maybe some of you are, are in a relationship with someone like that. If so, don't take that for granted. And I realized that this morning when I was in morning prayer and Ron was sitting next to me. Five years ago, Ron took me under his wing. I thought that I was a praying person. I thought that I was a praying man. And when I came to this church and I, and I began to pray with my, my friend Ron, he took me under his wing and he took me to levels that, I've never, that I never thought I would be there as far as my prayer life. He showed me, he taught me, he spoke to me patiently. And it's one of those things that 
We can't take that for granted. And it's one of the things we talked about in morning prayer this morning. Those are friendships, the relationships that we have with our husband, with our wives, with our children, with our friends, with our co-workers. We can't take those for granted because tomorrow is not promised to anyone. And we have to enjoy those things today. It's a gift from God that needs to be guarded and valued. Elijah says, where you go, I go. What you face, I will face with you. But the truth is that most aren't experienced this kind of community where relationships run deeper than the task at hand, where we generally care about one another. In our time and in our society, our lives are so rushed and we're, we, we've got to go here, we've got to do that, we've got to go to this meeting, we've got to be, meet this person, I have to go to this game, I have to take my son here, I have to meet my wife. We've run out of that community. We've run out of that time to spend with people and, 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 and just get to know them. Where we generally care for one another and yet the care gets expressed in tangible ways from a phone call to lunch together to just praying together. And that's what Pastor Ron did with me. We prayed together. We got to know each other. and We would speak for hours on Thursday nights. Many, I don't know, those of you who were new, we would pray on Thursday nights. That was our church prayer was here. Many times it was just me and Pastor Ron. And we, we, we got to know each other. I got to know him. He got to know me. We spent time with each other. It was, we didn't have to make a date because the date was already made. It was prayer night. And you see, Elijah didn't, make, didn't just take the time to serve. He made time for community. In God's heart that we serve, Jesus said, that he came not to be served, but to serve. But it's also his heart that our relationships run deep. That our love, our compassion, our generosity, and our gentleness for toward one another get expressed, not just in words, but in actions and in time spent with somebody, especially in the context of one's natural family and his spiritual family. Then in verse 8, they come to the Jordan River, knowing that their time together is very short, we're told here that Elijah takes his cloak, the mantle that he had put one on, on Elijah at one time, he rolls it up and he strikes the river with it or strikes the water of the Jordan with it. And just like for Moses, the waters separate and they cross the river on dry land. Lost my place. <laughs> Same time ago. He wraps it around, strikes the river. This is an amazing thing that happened. Just as the water was separated once for Moses and for Joshua, now it's separating for Elijah. And the two of them cross over on dry land. I love how the text reads here. We're about to be invited to an extraordinary event, to a moment in this book here. As they're walking across dry ground to the Jordan River, Elijah's fatherly heart is put on display. In verse 9, he turns to Elijah. But he doesn't give him an order. He doesn't give him advice. He simply asks Elijah a question. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken from you? What can I give to you? What is it that I can do for you, for your ministry, to make it? Because you're, you're going to start doing your ministry now. What is it I can give you or leave with you that will help you in doing that ministry? And that's a great question. Torch passers, mentors, need to ask that question on a regular basis. What do you need to soar? You're meant to fly. What is it that I can put beneath your wings to make you soar, to make you fulfill the ministry that God has given to you? What can I do for you? As you take on that task of being a mentor to somebody, those are that, this is a, an important question to ask. What is it I can do for you? What is it I can say for you? Where is it I can take you to make your ministry soar the way it should soar? Then the guy who just parted the waters of the river asks you what he can do for you. You basically have a wide range of choices to pull from, money, a relationship. But look at what Elisha asked for in the last part of verse 9. He says to Elijah, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit. Let me have what I've seen you over these last years that I've walked with you and talked with you. I've seen the work that you've done. I've seen how God works through you. I want a double portion of that because he's showing many things by saying that. At first it looks like as if Elijah is simply saying to Elijah, however much of the Holy Spirit you have, I want twice as much. But desiring more, desiring more of the Spirit in his life is only a small part of it. Like I shared earlier, Elisha was a Jew. He knew 
Jewish law. He knew the uh, the, uh, he knew the the first uh, the I forget what it was the Septuagint. I can't say the word now. That's it. <laughs> he knew it. He was a Jew. He knew these things. So he knew Old Testament law. Through the Old Testament, the laws of inheritance are made very, very clear that according to Deuteronomy 2017, the firstborn son is to receive a double portion of the inheritance. So what is Elijah telling Elijah here? I want to be your son. I want to inherit what your son would have had. I want to be your firstborn. I want that double portion. That's what he's telling. It's, it's, he's, he's, in a way, he's honoring Elijah by telling him this. I want a double portion. I'm not just the guy who walked with you for a couple of years and learned from you. I'm your son. I want to be your spiritual son, so I want a double portion, a double blessing of what you had so that I can start my ministry because I'm going to continue what you started. So Elijah isn't proudly asking to have twice the ministry of Elijah. Instead, he's crying out to Elijah, expressing his sole desire to be his spiritual son. He is showing his love for Elijah. He is saying to Elijah, I want to be your heir. I've watched your life. I've watched your ministry. I've seen your devotion. I've seen the difference that you've made. I've seen the way that you love God. I've seen the way that you long to serve him, and I want a double portion of that. And I believe so much in what you're doing that I want as best as I can to devote my ministry, my life, to trying to carry on your work and God's work. He's also showing his dependence on God. He's a very smart man, this man, Elisha. But I recognize, Elijah, that I cannot do it on my own. I'm too inadequate and way too fallen, and I need God's help. I need a double portion of what you have in order to do what I need to do. I need to know God and walk with God and be empowered by God as you've been. Elijah asked for exactly the right thing. You can imagine what it must have been in the heart of Elijah to think this will be a human being on earth after I'm gone who, is, who has this longing to serve God and is willing to sacrifice so much to devote himself to one task, the task that God has given him, the ministry that he's going to give him. So Elijah says to him in verse 10, If you see me when I am taken from you, it will be yours. Otherwise not. Seems like, it seems like a mean thing to say. But he already knows Elijah's not going to leave me. I've already tried to get rid of him twice. And the guy, the guy just won't. He's stuck to me like gum. And wherever I go, I know he's going to be there when I'm taken. So in a way, it seems like, but he says, I know if you're there, you get it. If you're not, well, I'm sorry. It's, it's not. It's not that way. I know you're going to be here. I know you're going to see, see me leave. So I know you're going to get that blessing. And so in verse 11, we read, as they were walking along with... And, and talking together, remembering what God had done in their past, thinking about all the mighty things that God had accomplished, and wondering what God might do in the future. Suddenly, God sends the limo for Elijah. And as they're walking along and talking together, suddenly a chariot of fire and horses of fire appeared and separated the two of them. And Elijah went up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah saw this and cried out, Father, my father the chariots of horsemen of Israel. And Elijah saw him no more. Then he took hold of his own clothes and tore them apart. Not out of anguish, but just, he was saying goodbye to his friend. He was saying goodbye to his father. And he wasn't mad at God. He was just, I'm on my own now. And it also signifies one other thing. He, once again, he took off the clothing of disciple. And now as you see, what we're going to see here in a minute. Can you imagine this a moment for Elijah as he sees that he sees that the whole thing, he realizes that the very fact that he's seen all this means that he will carry on the work of his mentor and that he will get a double portion of the Holy Spirit that Elijah had. The torch will keep burning, and yet Elijah is gone. The man who changed his life, who placed his mantle on him years earlier, who believed in him, taught him, loved him, He's gone. And also in an expression of unbearable grief and sorrow, he tears his clothes off. But he does more than that. He just, not in grief. In grief to the, some part, but now he's doing the same thing he did before. I'm taking, I'm ripping the clothes off of disciple, off my body. And what does he do next? He picks up the cloak that had fallen from Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. So he's in grief, partly in grief. He's taking his clothes and ripped them off his body. 
But he's also significant in another way. He's taking out the clothes. I'm no longer just the disciple, the one who walks beside the prophet. I'm now the prophet. And so what does he do? He, he kneels down and he gets the mantle of Elijah and he puts it on. And he takes on the role of prophet. And he went back and stood at the bank of the Jordan. The mantle got left behind, and Elijah picks it up and thinks of all that Elijah did. He goes back to the Georgia because it's time now for him to return to the ordinary world and become the prophet that God has called him to be, to see what God had had for him. Then he took the cloak that had fallen from him and struck the water with it, crying out, Where now is the Lord, the Lord, the God of Elijah? And you see, he's still kind of, still kind of leaning on his mentor. But as he strikes the Jordan with that mantle, The water parts for him too. It's a confirmation from God that you are now my prophet. Just as Elijah, your mentor, split the waters with with your your mantle, you're doing the same thing now. You are equal to him, and it's time to start your ministry. So Elijah takes the mantle left behind and assumes the position that he has been prepared for. And from, from here he goes on to have an extraordinary life. And you can read that. Second Kings covers what he did. Uh, but as you, as you are sitting here today, you may be asking, if I want to be a mentor, if I want to do, how is it that I find, how do I find my Elijah? How do I find my Joshua? How do I find my Timothy? How do I know? Because this is a step we all need to take. First, we must understand that mentoring others is one of the most important ministries any of us can have, especially leaders. But one that should not and is not limited to leaders. All of us can be mentors. You don't have to be the leader in a church. You don't have to be a leader anywhere. You can be a mentor. We can, we're, 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 as parents, we're mentors to our children. They, I think all of you who are our parents know this. They watch everything that we do, even the things that we don't want them to watch. They're watching it, and they see it. Even when we don't think they're in the room, they're in the room. You know, I've, I've seen my son Joshua do things. Like, well, where did you learn that? Well, I saw you do it, Dad. I'm like, when did I show you this? Like, you didn't show me. I saw you do it. They're everywhere. They have eyes. They're like the Holy Spirit. Wherever you're doing, they, they see you doing it and they, know, they remember these things. They want to be like us. First, we must understand, like, but one that should not, and it's not all, of us, all of us can be mentors. That's the first step, is realizing that we all can be mentors. The second one is prayer and lots of it. If you choose to be a mentor and you should choose to be a mentor, you need to pray. You need to be guided by God. You need to be just as Elijah was. He was guided by God in his mentoring and his disciples, discipling of Elisha. But how do we know? How are we to be sure without hearing from our, or being directed by God that we have a worthy Elisha to invest in? Because investing our time, our energy, is very similar to investing our money. When we invest our money, we want to be sure. We're careful about where we put our money when we invest it because what do we want? We want to return on our investment. And the same thing goes in the spiritual world. You want to make sure that who who you choose to mentor, who you choose to disciple, is someone who is equal to the task, just like Elijah, who accepts the position and that you're investing in something that there will not be a return to you, but will be a return to the kingdom of God. And this is what you want to look for. Our choice should not be, it should not be a new convert. And I know those are hard words to, say, to, to hear. But he or she should sow some fruits in their life. Their life should display or should start to show biblical values, priorities, and biblical perspectives. Their life should be led by faith. In other words, and don't get me wrong here, if, we, if when a new person comes to church and, and, and accepts Christ, it's not that we just leave him there and, and to, to fend for himself. We're going to help him and lift him up. But we need to see fruits in his life before you decide to invest in him if you want those returns to come back. And those are the things we need to see in his life. He needs to continue to come to church. You need to see the changes in life. You need to see that he is taking God's word and applying it to his life before you choose or you choose that person to be your disciple. You want to know that this guy is starting to grow firm roots in the word of God before I invest my time and my energy in him as a disciple and as a mentor. We're, we're, we're here to help everyone as they come into our church. But if, as far as mentoring and discipling someone, we have to be 
a little bit more careful about who we're going to spend that time with. It doesn't mean we let somebody new come and just struggle on their own. We build them up, we lift them up, but we're talking about mentoring somebody. So there's a difference. I want to make sure that you understand the difference between the two. And the best example I can give you is in 19, or when I first, the first time I received Christ and accepted him into my life, it was a small church like this. And no one told me what I was supposed to do. No one told me how I was supposed to act. And as hungry as I was for the Lord, after a time, I started to fall away from God. And I fell away from God for about seven years. I thought I was a Christian, but when I, when I, when I sat down and analyzed it, I really wasn't. And then in 1991, through the prayer of people who loved me, I went back to the church and I accepted Christ again. This time was different, though. Someone took me under their wing. Someone prayed for me. Someone showed me, this is how it is when, you're, when, you're, when you're, you read your words, you pray, you do this, and that's what should be done. Now, that person didn't eventually become my mentor, but he was the one who showed me, this is how you are when you're, when you're a new Christian. And so from that point on, I learned, I was fed, I was moved up, someone prayed for me, someone thought about me, and from there on, I found mentors in my life. Ron was a mentor in my life. There's other people who have been mentors in my life, but from that very thing, someone showed me what it is to be a Christian. So in that way, that's what I mean. We're not just to leave, leave them there to fend for themselves, but we feed them also. But I'm talking about who you choose to be a disciple for you, who you choose to be a mentor to, and those are the two things. Let's look at Elijah for further guidance and who, we sh who should be our, our disciple. It's important to notice where Elisha was when Elijah, Elijah found him. You remember the verse. Though it was apparent that he was wealthy and came from wealth, where was he? He was at work in the field with the rest of the field hands. He was there working. This guy's rich. I've got all this coming to me. I don't need to do anything. These guys can do it for me. I'll sit back at home in my, in my home in Lake Las Vegas and kick back while the money rolls in. But he's not there. He's out in the field working. Doesn't have to be, but he's there. He is not lazy. He's not irresponsible. I would guess that this young man had a good testimony among his friends and family. He kept his mind and his hands busy. And we've seen this trait time and time again in the Bible. Moses was pastoring the flock of, his, of Jethro, his father-in-law, when, when he saw the burning bush. David was tending sheep for his father when Eli came to, or Samuel came to anoint him. They were busy. Peter was fishing when Jesus called him. Paul, by trade, was a tent maker. And it, was, it makes sense. Was, the Lord himself was a carpenter by trade who was trained by his father, Joseph. So they kept themselves busy. They kept their mind and their hands busy. And that's something you need to see when you see somebody. It's not a lazy person or an irresponsible person. Like we said, we need to see the fruits of, their, of the Holy Spirit begin to work in their life as we choose who we're, going to, who we're going to disciple. Another thing we need to look at in Elijah is his response. When the mantle came on his shoulders, his response was immediate. There was no hesitation, no riding on the fence. As we will see, his request regarding his father and his mother was not an act of hesitation. Elijah, Elisha, was decisive, which indicates the previous work of God in his life. He was trained by his parents. He was a Jew. He knew what was going to happen. He knew Elijah. He knew what was happening when he put his mantle on his shoulders. He knew all this, and yet he accepted it immediately. The word tells us he left his plow and said, just, let me just say goodbye to my parents. He's not saying, well, hold on here. Let me think about this and go talk to my parents. He says, no, let me go say goodbye to them so they don't worry about me, and then I'll follow you. Got no problem. His response was immediate. He was decisive. He indicates the previous work of God and God's perfect what? His perfect timing in all things. His request to honor his parents. Elijah requested that he might go back to kiss his father and his mother. And then I will follow you. This is not an attempt to put the call off or, 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 or any hesitation. Some wrongly related this to the story in Luke in chapter 9. The Lord already knew that man's heart. He saw it for what it was, a lack of commitment and an attempt to avoid his call. Elisha wasn't attempting to avoid anything. He, leaped, he leapt from his, where he was with his joke, and he said, let me just say goodbye, and I'm, I'm right back. I'm right back here with you, and I will follow you. Even, though I'm, even if I'm leaving everything, I'm still going to follow you. 
With Elijah, the case is entirely different. Elijah's request was prompted by two things. One, it was an act of genuine respect and honor for his parents. I'm not just going to leave here and let my, my parents wonder where I am or what I'm doing and let them hear it from somebody else. I respect and I honor my parents enough to go tell them, this is the calling I've got. The second one, it was prompted by a desire to celebrate his entrance into his ministry and declare and confirm his commitment to follow the Lord before friends and family. He wanted everybody to know, I want my friends, I want my family, I want everybody in this community to know where I'm going. I'm going to go serve the Lord. And it was a celebration. It wasn't a funeral, it was a celebration of his new life. Now the celebration, let's look at that. The oxen and the implements, the wood and the yokes, we, we talked about it earlier, represented the tools of his former trade and the means for his life. This is how he made his living before. Then, verse 21, then is basically Elijah's declaration of his commitment to follow the Lord's calling. What he was doing was burning his bridges and counting his past as lost for the Lord and that he might gain and attain the new life and ministry that God had for him as a prophet. Elijah was showing his family and friends that he had new goals, new aims, new aspirations, new commitments, new values, new priorities. It showed his determination to look back and seek, and to never look back or never to seek to go back or leave the calling of God, no matter how tough it might get. That this, is, this is a must for believers and especially for spiritual leaders. Our path, our walk with Christ, or our walk, our walk, our path, our, our path to Christ-likeness. For some, this process is easy at times. Sometimes it's tough at times. It's, in a way, an unattainable goal. But it's one that we should eagerly and enthusiastically work to attain. Most in this room have taken the first step in that walk toward Christ-likeness. You have accepted Christ as your Savior. Savior, You have repented. You no longer walk in darkness, but you walk in the light of Jesus Christ. Next, we must become disciples of Christ. But becoming a disciple of Christ comes with a cost. And in Luke chapter 14, in verses 26, 27, and 33, Christ describes for us the cost associated with being a disciple of his. Starting in 26, if you want to be my disciple, you must hate everyone else by comparison. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. If you want to carry, if you do not, excuse me, if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. So you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything you own. Those are tough words, but they're not my words. They're the words of Christ. What these verses are telling us is that in order to be a disciple of Christ, we must love Christ supremely and above all others, even more than we love our own flesh and blood. The word hate in the scripture or in this verse doesn't mean anything antagonistic or anything against a person. What it means here is to love everything less. Christ, our love for Christ is here, and my love for my family and my wife and everything is down here. What it's telling us, our love for Christ must be so strong that all other loves look like hate. Our, my love for you and my brothers and sisters is so small, so infinitesimal compared to the love that I have, that we must have for Christ, that it almost looks like hate, even though I still love you. And that's what it is to, be, to follow Christ as his disciple. And we, we're willing to carry our cross after him. What does it mean to carry a cross? It means daily identification with Christ in shame, in suffering, and our surrender to God's will. It means death to self, to our own plans and ambitions, and a willingness to serve him as he directs us, as he directs our life. The cross is something that we willingly accept from God as part of his will for our lives. When you have taken this step and you're willing to be a disciple of Christ, you are ready to continue on your path to Christ's likeness. You are ready to serve and not be served, just as Christ said. You are ready to be an Elijah. And so again, I ask you, 
that you ask yourself, do I have people in my life that I'm passing the torch to? Who am I investing what I have been given by God? Who am I investing that into? And that's part of our vision statement here. One body united by love and discipleship. And that question I'll ask you again, who are you pouring your life into? Who are you investing your time and your energy in the spiritual world among, amongst you? Now, as you might be sitting there, you might be saying, like I said, most of us here have taken that first step in our, in our walk with Christ, in our, in our walk to get to be like Christ. We've accepted Jesus as our, as our Savior. But as I, as I conclude here, I, I want to make sure that everyone here has taken that step. And if you want to at that time, if the, if the Holy Spirit is moving in you that I want to accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, then maybe it's not even that. Maybe you're sitting there saying, you know what, I've, I, like David, let myself slip away. And I want to recommit myself to Jesus Christ. If that's you here this morning, and I ask you to step forward in front of this congregation and accept Christ and recommit your life to Christ if that's what you want. And maybe you're sitting there saying, yeah, I am serving God. I am a disciple, but I want to go to that next step. I want to find somebody who I can disciple. I want to find somebody who I can pour myself into. And if you want prayer in that direction, then I ask you to step forward and, and receive prayer in that area that you can find your Elijah, that you can find your Timothy, that you can find your Joshua, and you can pour yourself into that person. You can share with you the gift that you've been giving and give, uh, that you have been given by God, and that you can share that gift and impart it into somebody else so that the torch can be passed to the next generation. I thank you for your time.